Okay, for this video, trying something new. I have prepared slides, um, and I've posted those separately, and not going to use them here. So essentially what this will be is the old style Khan Academy, um, and then the slides will be separate, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of built them on the same platform. So hopefully the two will work together for uh, everybody to end up with what they need. It's a lot to cover in this video, so I'm going to get right to it. What's employment income? Well, employment income is everything you receive from your employer. Goodness, need to get better writing here. From employer. Okay, so if you're in an employment relationship, uh, this is, you know, if we want to go back to the ocean and the fish, everything is caught in this net. Everything you receive and when is it income when included on receipt okay so almost cash basis except we'll see there's a lot of deeming that needs to happen here um, so even if you haven't received it you'll be deemed to have received it okay so when we think about employment income what's going to be included our default is everything it's very very unlikely it's going to be included so the cash stuff is very easy to see but then we have this idea of a benefit Okay, and what is a benefit? Well, if it's an employment benefit specifically, it is, just as we've noted, it's received from the employer. So the implication is that you have, you're getting this because of your uh, work. And the key piece here is it increases the net worth of the individual. Okay, so if they give you of the recipient, okay, so in our case, this will be the employee. If, if they give you something um, that doesn't do that, then maybe it won't qualify as a benefit. And we'll look. Okay, so but basically anything you get that's of value will be a benefit. But there are exceptions. Okay, so there are things that will meet the definition of a benefit as just stated there, increasing the net worth of the person. And I'm just going to refer you to the slides for the full list and the text at section 3125 um, and uh, but the key ones kind of the highlight ones these are statutory exceptions we have we've already met actually on the employer side the RPP anything they put away and then anything that they um, do for you and in group insurance wise generally will not be included even though it does increase your net worth it is not included okay so that's the first key thing, key piece, the overall arch, overarching stuff. Now, we have to get to the difference between an allowance and a reimbursement. Okay, because both are cash flows from employer to employee, and uh, but they're different. The Act tries to treat them differently. So an allowance is normally, and this is all kind of generalization, a set amount whereas uh, a reimbursement is based on um, expenditures that have been made by the employee and we're gonna we are going to um, give you back what you have paid um, and reimburse it so the default treatment here uh, so the kind of baseline treatment for an allowance is it is included okay meaning taxable if you just give someone an allowance it's generally taxable and over here it is not included that's just the baseline okay now the only way a reimbursement really gets tripped up is if it's not reasonable so let's just make this one statement not included if reasonable okay or you could say unless unreasonable either way most reimbursements will not be included okay now over here on the allowance side there are exceptions okay specific exceptions stated in the act and a lot of these are and that travel, car, and other, I mean all set, but the key thing here again is reasonable. So as long as there's some idea that the the, the employee's net worth is not being um, uh, completely subsidized or increased by this, this thing, then it's possible it will not be included. Okay, so there you go. Moving on next. So Basically, we've already looked at, we'll go back here, what's a benefit? Now all we're going to do is look at specific times there are benefits. So from here on, 
it's basically specific benefits. And why do we look at them? Well, because benefits, the key, the, the tricky thing is how to value them. Okay, so because a lot of these are not somebody handing somebody else a dollar or hundred dollars or a million dollars, that's not what's happening. So we're just going to look at a couple specific examples. Okay, so the first one is a loan. So if the employer, so this is from the employer to the employee. Okay, so basically saying, hey, you work for us. Here's one way we can help you out. We can give you a low rate. So at a low rate. Okay, low relative to what? Well, relative to something called the prescribed rate. So you're getting a benefit relative to this thing called the, the prescribed rate. And what we want to note here is that it's calculated. So the benefit is calculated by quarter. The baseline is what you would have paid. This what we're going to call the prescribed rate. So if you didn't get this loan from your employee, you would have had to get it in the open market. That's what you would have paid. And baseline, whoops, sorry, baseline, so this, so number two, we'll just write it out again, baseline minus what you actually pay is equal to your benefit. Okay, so you can think of it as interest not paid um, because of your employment relationship. So let's just do a quick example. Um, actually, we can get rid of this. Uh, I'll bring it back in later. How do I get rid of it? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So, um, so here's an example. Okay. So we have a hundred thousand dollar loan. Let's make this nice and easy on ourselves with round numbers at three percent per year. Okay. And when was it given? So the loan was granted, the money changed, the capital changed hands on April 14th, 2012. Okay, so what quarter is that in? That's in quarter two, right? The quarters of the year. Hopefully everybody's familiar with what the quarters of the year are. Okay, so let's just get some facts here. The prescribed rate, which is a, a, a rate that the government tells us what it is, in quarter two was 7%, in quarter three was 6%, so it's dropping, in quarter four, it was 5%. Okay, so those are our facts. So now what we want to do is figure out the benefit for 2012. Okay, so again, all we're trying to do is figure out what would he have paid, uh, this employee have paid, and what did he pay. So what would he have paid by quarter? Well, in quarter two, he would have paid, I'll just, I'm going to, well, let's keep the that 100,000. 100,000 times 7%, okay, that's the rate that was in place, times the number of days, so I'm going to write this out because this is just the months, right, so there's 16 days in April, he took it out on the 14th, 16th in April, um, 31 in May, 30 in June, and so that's going to work out to 1400, um, uh, yeah, 1470, okay, quarter three, he's going to have $100,000 still outstanding, but now his prescribed rate is 6%, and the number of days in those months is 92 over 365. That is going to work out to 1510. As long as my math is right, I made up this example, so if the math is wrong, someone will point it out at some point, I'm sure. Um, f times 5% times 31. I made do these in order yet. Yeah, 31 plus 30. Plus 31 over 365, that's going to give me 1260. I add up those and I get 4240. Okay, so that's the would have or the baseline. Okay, I'll just write that's what he would have paid. What did he pay? Or what is he deemed to have paid, regardless of whether it actually happened? He paid $100,000 times 3% times. 261 days over 365 equals 2140 and that gives him a benefit of $2100 okay so yeah it's a lot of math it's repetitive but it's fairly simple math and um, that gets included in his taxable income okay moving on to 
uh, topic that you will, as I've mentioned, I think before, cars. Oh, sorry, cars. So here we go. Car. Okay, and this is it, the key is here that the employer owns it. Okay, so we're going to make to do our best to keep everything very clear in our heads about who owns the car. So this time it's the it's the employer owning it. So all that can happen here, we're not talking at all about what the employee can deduct. We do not we're not care we don't care what they deduct. All we what they can deduct. That's a completely separate issue. What we want to know is what could be the possible benefits be. Well, according to the government, there are two specific benefits. The first one, most people would come to mind, and they call it the operating benefit. And that is the costs paid by the employer. Okay, po costs paid by the employer for personal kilometers. So if you have this, so for personal kilometers, if you have a car that somebody else owns and you get to use it, what you didn't pay for your own to 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 run it, um, you, you uh, that's a benefit to you. Okay, the second one is not quite as intuitive to some people, so we need to understand what it is. It's the standby. Basically, this is the value of having the car available. Okay, so it, this may take some getting used to for some people. Think, wait, I, so you're, you're, it's a benefit to have it sitting in your driveway? Yeah, actually. Okay, so the calculation of this is uh, pretty simple. There are two options for the benefit. So the benefit uh, that you are receiving when somebody else pays for it is 26 cents per the government times personal personal kilometer. Okay, so the number of personal kilometers you do. There is an option here if 50% of the of the use is um, business. Okay, so there's going to be a bunch of 50% floating around here. We want to keep them straight. Uh, let's get rid of this too. 50% um, of it is uh, for business. Then um, you can. Uh, sorry, I've lost. It. Oh yeah, then you your your option is to just instead of taking 26 cents per kilometer, you can say 50% times whatever my standby charge is. Okay, so, whoops, there's a D missing there, charge. Okay, so this, you can take 50% of this. How do you calculate this? Well, this is complicated. Okay, but it should make some sense. So what we want, want to do here is we want to bring in uh, this picture that I cut before. Sorry, I don't have this quite ready. So this is the standby charge. Okay, so we're going to bring this in. And basically, what I'll, I'll do here is so this is in your this is in your text, um, and what I want to do so here's the formula. There's your formula. But if they own it, you're going to ignore this because this is a uh, it's for leases, so they own this part right now. So let's just take a quick look at what the A and the B are, or what sorry what all these letters are. So A over B is just the personal portion. Okay, but um, there's key thing here is what or personal use I guess you could say but the B is not um, uh, let me just point out here B is not the the actual kilometers that you drive see it is different the other key thing here is that this whole ratio is set to one if business use is less than or equal to fifty percent okay so you don't even get to to take a portion of the cost um, or have it reduced I guess by uh, if if you don't use it for more than fifty percent C is the cost okay so that's pretty straightforward I would hope and it includes HST okay and this is going to feel a little bit different from what we've seen and we're going to want to reconcile that but this is basically the cost of the car and it is not capped um, like at thirty thousand dollars like class ten point one and d is simply the number of months okay so when you look at this formula it's basically a ratio two percent times a cost times the number of months okay so it shouldn't be that bad the two the things that are prescribed sixteen sixty seven that's just told to you two percent told to you 
by the act. Okay, so please note here that yeah, okay, I already noted that for you. So here is uh, an example. Okay, a quick example. Example: um, A car costs uh, fifty thousand dollars plus sixty five hundred of HST, and it was bought two years ago. Okay, so we're not going to do any proration here. Yay. Okay, so bought two years ago. Personal kilometers are 32,000. Uh, total kilometers are 40,000. Okay, so they definitely meet the 50% threshold. So what's our A? A is equal to 8,000. That's the personal kilometers, right? So the difference. Uh, B is equal to... 1667 times 12. So you notice the formula here is 16, uh, 1667 total available days divided by 30. But that they're just trying to get at months. So we can shorten that to 2004. Okay. C is the cost. And what is that? Is it capped at 30? No, it is not. It's every dollar that was spent. And D is 12 number of months. Again, it, you could do 365 over 30, but we it rounds to 12. Okay, so that's it. Plug those in, and what's your standby charge? Standby charge is equal to 8,000 over 2004 times 2% times 56.5 times 12. Okay, and if I've done my math right, that's five, four, two, three. Okay, and so what's his? That's his standby charge. What's his operating benefit? Well, he gets to choose between two. So his first choice is twenty-six cents times eight thousand. That is equal to two thousand eighty. And his second option is one half of five, four, two, three. And that is 2711. So he's going to choose that. So his total income inclusion for this car is the sum of these two numbers, which I didn't bother adding, but they look pretty addable. So we will go with that, if my math is right. There. So the employer provides a car. He uses it for 8,000 personal kilometers. And that is apparently worth. And they pay all of the operating expenses too, and that is worth $7,500 to him in the year, and so that's what he pays tax on. Okay, there you go. One more thing to cover, actually two more, but they're they're quick. Okay, so this one is employment insurance, and this is not this is not the government EI. So this is basically if your if your uh, employer pays into plans for you. And there's two choices, at least in our world, in the tax world, there's two choices that are, have to be made. Non-group versus group. So am I buying this just for you or am I buying it for a, a, a group of employees? And secondly, does the employer, does the employee pay it all or does the employer pay some of it? Why do I not like L's? Employer um, contributes or doesn't? Okay, so now we actually do, so see, these are just basically two, um, you know, binary choices. Is it a group plan or isn't it? Um, so the questions that we need to ask, though, it is not, even though we're on the, uh, on the income side right now, let's, there are questions that need to be figured out are, is the employee premium deductible? So when you pay it, can you deduct it from... Um, employment income that amount sort of like an RSP can you can you take it away if you put this money away that's a question and then is the employer premium premium uh, taxable to the employee obviously we're only on the employee side can the employee when the employer makes the thing is it taxable as a benefit okay so this is, is what we're talking about today really and then the third question we'll kind of put off to the side is, is for both, in both cases, is the benefit taxable? So if you end up having to collect 
on this, which you may not, and then you ultimately I would think would hope not to, because it means you're either sick or disabled in some way. But if you end up having to use it, is it taxable? And the the textbook provides us with a nice little chart here. So hopefully this is going to come up more easily this time. Yeah, there it is. Oh, insurance chart. So this chart in the textbook lays it out. Okay, and what? So I won't bother walking through it entirely but you can see so think of it this way here's the first choice group versus non-group and if the employer is not involved so here's option one and option two and we'll call this group is we'll just group a non-group okay when the employer is not involved the tax treatments are identical okay remember high school math that line means they're the same or those that indication means they're the same congruent um, uh, if the employer is involved, then essentially what you're doing, you, when you you're choosing between group and non-group, you're saying, okay, when the premium when the premium is paid, it will not be taxed. Therefore, when if you collect, you'll be you'll have in, uh, income inclusion then. Or if it's non-group, which they like, will buy your individual plans one at a time, you will not have to include the premium that the employer pays for you at the time, and I'm sorry, I said that backward. You will include and pay tax on it, but when you collect, no tax. Okay? So it's essentially a choice. The government says, okay, one or the other. Um, you can decide whether you think it one encourages one or the other, but it's just uh, essentially, I don't think they're actually, it favors one way or the other. It's a, at the end of the day, it's gambling. You're choosing and you're, you're in expectation making a, a choice. The last thing we want to talk about are loyalty programs. Um, so these are points, very common these days. Most people still call them even though they aren't always tied to airlines anymore. People call them frequent flyer points. And this is, it's a very, very interesting thing because it meets all of the definitions of a benefit. Okay, so it absolutely, if you, you say, is it a benefit? The answer is yes, absolutely. Your net, go, net worth goes up. You get to fly places and pay less but is it included and the government or the the CRA has tried for a long time and finally in 2004 to, uh, when was it 2009 I don't have it right here in my notes uh, recently at least in, in terms of people my age what we refer to as recent um, they gave up and said no no unless you actually convert to cash Okay, so which is, is pretty rare, but it, it can happen. Or, so that's one, one condition, or it's actually used as remuneration, which I've never really heard of, but maybe out there somewhere is, hey, listen, come work for us. We'll pay you 30000 We'll pay you $30. I don't know. We'll pay you X, and um, but your total compensation will actually be X plus the frequent flyer miles that you get to accumulate. Um, I haven't heard of that, but if it's proven that that's it's part of your remuneration then it is taxable but uh, I think that's rare to happen okay so sorry for the length but this is a lot to cover and hopefully this is helpful